and welcome to Whiskey Politics. I'm Dave Sussman, your host and purveyor at whiskeypolitics.net. Find us at America's Voice News, YouTube, and all of your favorite podcast applications. And if you're listening to us on iTunes, I'm going to ask if you can take a moment and give us a rating. Uh, just click on the ratings button and give us a five-star rating if you're enjoying the show, that is. And a quick comment. It helps others find us on the Apple iTunes uh, conglomerate that they are, the hugeness that Apple is, Google, Apple, Facebook, Twitter. It's insane. The tech titans basically run this world today. And uh, got some interviews coming up. Uh, they're finalized, uh, being finalized right now uh, of a... Uh, of an event we just worked earlier in the week at American Freedom Alliance and got some horrible news out of that uh, with some fascinating interviews, but I'm going to get into that in the next episode. Uh, but uh, boy, free speech. Uh, you know, the whole idea of free speech being something that we should all assume is a right, assume is always going to be there. D don't think differently about it, especially for those people that are not in social media, those people that are not following politics, uh, likely not watching this show, uh, they're just going around with their lives doing what they're doing. But the fact is, is that your speech is now controlled. And I just read a report this morning that Microsoft Word, you know, Word for Windows, I think everybody's used Microsoft Word, uh, is now their next version or edition of Microsoft Word is now going to have an autocorrect for political correct speech or politically incorrect speech. Think about this for a minute. Politically incorrect speech is now going to be corrected by Microsoft, the tech titans. This is, this is getting really, really scary. It has gotten scary. And in our next episode, please stay tuned. We, we're going to have some information on a... Uh, an event that I just worked in American Freedom Alliance and some collateral damage that came from that event. And uh, we'll get into that in much more detail in the next few episodes. But in the meantime, today's guest, uh, I'm very excited to have. He's a good friend, conservative comedian. And the reason I accentuate conservative comedian is because there are so few and far between today. Uh, I can't think of more than maybe a handful that I can name. Uh, and uh, Evan said he is a is a great guy. He used to write for uh, liberal Hollywood, Bill Maher, Arsenio Hall. Uh, he's an author of a couple, three books. He's got another one coming out shortly. Uh, his newest book, Apocalypse Now, is a wonderful way for us to use humor in this discussion. Because if you're not laughing at this, you're crying. This crackdown on our ability to communicate with each other. You must say this word and you cannot say that word. And as a kid who grew up in the 1970s, older Gen Xer, you know, we grew up watching Mel Brooks. We grew up watching all of the, you know, the different movies, Caddyshack, Stripes, Animal House. These are things that could not be produced today. Blazing Saddles, I mean, you know, that's the off-mention example. But oh my goodness, are you kidding me? The producer, director, and writer would be hauled off to the Hollywood Gulag today. Great movie, by the way, for kids younger. You know, if you haven't watched Blazing Saddles, fire it up on the old, uh, on the old uh, cable box there because it's, 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 it's outstanding and it makes fun of itself. But the, the fact is, is that we are now in a place where you can no longer have this language. You can no longer discuss things. The Microsoft Word example, where they are now having politically correct speech fixed for you by the denizens of Seattle, Washington, D.C. and Silicon Valley. I'm sorry, Seattle, Washington State and Silicon Valley. This is getting really, really scary. So what Evan does so well, and the reason that we're having him back on the show is because with his newest book, Apocalypse Now, he takes the humor to them. He makes fun of them. And this is something that I've talked about before in speeches and, and probably on the show as well. This is the way you win the cultural debate. This is the way that if you are going to enter into the form of ideas and the exchange of our philosophy versus somebody else's philosophy regarding free markets, 
then you have to make it so it is palatable for the other side to listen to. I don't want to be yelled at or screamed at by social justice warriors. They're going to call me a racist. They're going to call me a xenophobe. They're going to call me a bigot. Okay, it, it, we're done. The conversation is over. But if we could bring in the middle, okay, the, the left of center folks that are somewhat uncomfortable with what they're seeing coming out of the left right now regarding the push towards socialism, okay, and they're looking for a reason to vote for the R or the conservative, more conservative person in their election. Give them a reason by making them laugh. Find the humor in what the left is doing. And if you could do that, you win the debate. You use their own words. AOC's idiocy is ripe, is absolutely for the pickings because there's just so much dumb. There's just so much stupid. And you could go, we could do an entire show on things that AOC has said. But in the meantime, I want her to be the face of the Democratic Party. Right? Ilhan Omar, Rashid Tlaib, AOC. You know what? I, I don't want these people to be in power. I don't want them to be on the Foreign Services Committee in Congress. But I want them to be the face of the party because what it does is it shows the reality of how extreme these people really are. So... We're going to have uh, Evan on. We're going to discuss all of this coming up here after the break. Evan Sayet, conservative comedian. And by the way, check out his uh, stand-up special on Amazon, A Deplorable Mind. Uh, you know, unfortunately, I don't think it's on Netflix. <laughs> We're going to talk a lot about Netflix. We're going to talk about Hollywood. We're going to talk about the suppression of conservative speech and free speech overall coming up here after the break. And again, please don't forget to find us on America's Voice News. Click on YouTube, check out Whiskey Politics, hit the subscribe and the notification bell, and uh, you'll never miss another episode. Dave Sussman, Whiskey Politics. We'll be right back after the break. And welcome back to Whiskey Politics. Dave Sussman, again, bringing you back, talking about uh, free speech and everything else that's going on in the world right now. And I am delighted to have my good friend Evan Sayet, a conservative comedian, one of the very few, if not uh, less than a handful out there these days. Uh, Evan is also an author and a political commentator. And his latest book, Apocalypse Now, the follow-up to uh, The Kindergarten of Eden, which was also another fantastic book, is just killing it on the Amazon charts. Well, Welcome, Evan. How are you doing? I'm doing well, Dave. How are you? I'm doing really good. So for uh, our audience at Whiskey Politics, uh, you have they don't know, but you've been on our radio show a couple of times. Wait, and, wait, why uh, wouldn't they know? You don't think they can do two things? You think they just watch you? Of course, they, they listen to the radio as well. They do? Of course. They I do. didn't know that. We can multitask. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's because those, those of us conservatives in Los Angeles, we got nothing else to do, so... Might as well listen to the radio. That, that's, that, that's exactly what it is. That's exactly what it is. Okay, I want to talk about the book, uh, and we're going to get very heavily into the book in just a few moments. But first, I want to get your impression upon what the heck is going on with this, just this clampdown right now on our free speech. We're seeing it all across the board with Twitter. Horowitz, David Horowitz just got banned yesterday, and uh, a whole bunch of folks yep. got kicked off last week. What's going on with free speech right now? Are you concerned? Oh, it's not. I'm, t I'm terribly concerned. Look. They own every single one of the important ministries. They own the Ministry of Indoctrination, the, the schools and, and, and the universities. They own the Ministry of Propaganda with the news and entertainment industries. They own the Ministry of Communication with Google and, and Facebook and whatnot. And now we're getting into one of the last places where there was at least some hope, which was in the corporate world. But the corporate world has come to recognize that we have reached this tipping point where there's more money to be made in advancing the leftist fascism, the leftist lies, than there is in, in the patriotic pro-American line that up until recently was where profits were, were to be found. You know, be supportive of the people who, who, who support you. Well, we've reached this tipping point after 30 years of the leftists having taken over the universities, taken over the public schools, and produced generation after generation of mindless foot soldier. And, you know, I, I think it was Jerry Rubin, it might have been Mark Rudd, all the way back in the 1960s, 
said the real flowering of the 60s will come in the 90s when the children of the 60s become the powers that be. He was wrong by one generation because once they were the powers that be, they then needed to use those institutions to create their mindless foot soldiers, their revolutionaries, their the equivalent of Hitler Youth. Or, or I, I forget what Stalin called the, and Lenin called the children they produced. So if he was right that a generation is 30 years, the 60s until the 90s, well, he needed one more generation, add 30 years to 1990, and what do you get? 2020. Well, yeah, that's where we are right now. We, we where, this, yeah. go, so you, you go, and you, we've talked about this before, and you can go back several generations. We talk about the Frankfurt School starting in the 40s and 50s and uh, the, the children of the 60s, as you just talked about. Where did it turn so significant? Because what, uh, you got the generation in the 80s and the 90s. I was in college in the 80s, and yeah, I mean, we... You know, we were unhappy about apartheid, right? Everybody has to have a cause when you're young. Right. But we could talk. I mean, Animal House and Blazing Saddles was the greatest movies of all time. Right. Now you can't even have a discussion with somebody without somebody being butthurt, basically. Yeah, and, and where, where it turned was they needed... They, this, this, is a, this is the culmination of the revolution the 60s radicals attempted to overthrow the government with. And... People don't really rec remember the 60s radicals and they think about the 60s revolution as peace, love and Woodstock and flowered dresses and flowers in your hair. But the revolutionaries, those are the mindless foot soldiers. The revolutionary leaders wanted a violent, vicious overthrow of, of the United States government. They planted bombs and murdered people. Mark Rudd and Jerry Rubin both exhorted children to murder their parents. All right, these were not lovely people who wanted peace and understanding. These were people who were violent and vicious, and the problem for them was twofold. One, they couldn't get people, grown-ups, to join them in their revolution, because as real and as, as were the grievances that blacks had, that women had, that others had back in, in the 1950s and 60s and 70s, they still knew that America was not only better than any place else they could live, but was already getting even better. The Republicans already begun to integrate the military. The Republicans, Eisenhower had already begun to integrate the schools. So they, these, these people, even with righteous grievances, wouldn't join the 60s revolution. There's a great story about Muhammad Ali. All right, now, this is a man who actually suffered not microaggressions, but real aggressions, right? Not dog whistles, but real vile and vulgar attacks. And preparing for a fight in Africa, it was called the Rumble in the Jungle, it was nicknamed. And he decided to train over in Africa. He spent a month in training. He set up training camp in Zaire. And when he came back from Africa, the reporters asked him, how'd you like Africa, Muhammad? And Muhammad Ali said, quote, thank God my granddaddy got on that boat. Right. So when they were defeated in the streets, they couldn't find followers. When they were defeated, the ballot boxes in, in landslides that are almost impossible to beat 49 states, 48 states. When, when they, they, they did what was called the long march through the institutions. They right. went undercover and went and took over the cultural pressure points of education, entertainment, news. And from there, under the radar began to produce people. If they couldn't find real grievances, they spent their time brainwashing children into thinking they were aggrieved. And we have now reached that tipping point where back in the 80s, there were still people left over who were from the last of the great generations. But by the 90s, by the 2000s, they'd either retired or been forced out. And now there is nothing but nonstop propaganda. And they have reached the point now where they feel they, 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 you know, people call um, Ilham Omar and, 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 and um, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez the new face of the Democratic Party. It's the same face of the Democratic Party. They just feel comfortable finally taking off their masks. By the way, Righteous Grievances was my favorite alt band uh, from high school days. Mm -hmm. you know, I think they were <laughs> garage band. Really, mine was Why Do I Have Acne? <laughs> 
You do a lot of speaking engagements. Um, let me ask you, I mean, when you talk about this, you're using humor and, and a lot of the way that you communicate with people is very funny. Uh, we seem to be missing a lot of that these days, especially in our pop culture and our late night shows. What's going on with the lack of humor nowadays? Well, it, it, it's twofold. One, the left has replaced, as it's replaced everything, just like it's replaced education with leftism, just like it's replaced journalism with leftism. It has replaced humor with vitriol, with leftist vitriol. All Bill Maher has to do, and remember, I wrote Politically Incorrect for six years back in the day, back, back when the show was actually funny and Maher wasn't such a hysterical leftist. And, and, and all Bill Maher has to say is, Trump's Hitler. And, and the audience will, will applaud and scream and laugh hysterically because they're conditioned. They're, they're, they're autom automatons. They, they are mindless foot soldiers. They are brain dead liberals who have been marched through the education system, not learning anything. So you can't have real humor if there's not real learning. It requires a turn of a phrase. It requires basic knowledge. So all the left has left. If you ever watch Samantha B, she doesn't say anything funny. No. It's just it's, it's just a sentence of hate followed by cheers and applause and an Emmy Award. But well, that's what we see with Kimmel as well, or, or whoever oh, may be up there. It, it, and it's, and it's. I mean, they're not even funny, though. That's the thing. I don't laugh when I watch these guys. I just get, I, I just get the message, yes, you're aggrieved. Yes, you're angry. Right. But that's supposed to be comedy today? Well, look, there, there's a reason my history is... After I gave up stand-up comedy, my boy was born. I didn't want to be on the road 40 weeks a year. I started writing television shows. Right. And I've written some of the most disparate television shows you can imagine. I mean, I wrote the Arsenio Hall show as the voice of black America, all the way to the Oak Ridge Boys live from Las Vegas, all right, as white hick as you can get. I wrote Politically Incorrect with Bill Maher to the left. I was the original writer of a game show, a, a comedy game show called Win Ben Stein's Money. Ben Stein being to the right. There Speaking was a, of Jimmy Kimmel. I, I brought Jimmy Kimmel to television on that show, absolutely. And So it's all your fault. Well, a lot of things are my fault. I brought <laughs> gangster rap to television. I mean, indirectly, there are a lot of things that, that are my fault. But that right. being said, there was a reason that I was able to write for, for a black guy and white and, and, and white rednecks for a Jew from New York and, a, and for all these different people because a joke is a joke is a joke. There's wit and there's a turn of a phrase and there's, a, there, there's cadence. And when you say they're not funny, it's not that we disagree with their point. I can laugh at jokes about myself and my side. It's that they're not funny because there's no craft, there's no art, there's no cleverness, there's no wit, there's no turn of a phrase. It's just hate. Let's talk more about this after the break. We've got Evan Sayat and his new book, Apocalypse Now. We'll be right back after the break. Dave Sussman here, Whiskey Politics. And Dave Sussman back with you at Whiskey Politics and America's Voice News. And you can find us at uh, YouTube as well as this channel and uh, all of our Facebook. And Evan, where can folks find you? You have a Twitter, you're on Facebook. I've got everything. What am I, an idiot, David? <laughs> that sounded like my parents. When you say my full name with the idiot in there. <laughs> No, I don't. I, 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 of course, it's hashtag Evan Say it. It, it. I'm sorry. I guess I am an idiot. It, it's at Evan Say It. It's Evan Say It on Facebook. It's Evan dot. It's Evan dot Say It at Gmail dot com. And of course, it's Evan Say It. S and Sam A Y E T at uh, dot com is my website. And uh, by the way, great. Uh... Uh, a great stand-up special. I believe it's still on Amazon Prime, The Deplorable Mind. It, it, right. Evan say it, A Deplorable Mind. Yeah. You can guess what the politics is, and you'll go to it, and you'll notice that there actually is our turns of a phrase. There are, even, even though you might not like the politics, the joke is the joke is the joke, and unless you can laugh at yourself, one of the problems, David, is that the left is so aware that this is war. This is right. war to them. That to laugh at themselves would be to weaken their side. You know, it, it, it's almost blasphemy. It's almost uh, for them to, that's why they wouldn't make jokes about Barack Obama. Are you serious? You can't find anything funny about a guy who thinks there are 57 states. You, you can't find anything funny about a guy who thinks they, 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 they uh, speak Latin and whatever. And, and you can't find anything funny. Of course they could. 
Of course they could, but they were unwilling to do it because they think it weakens their side. It shows their God to have chinks. And, I, well, I got to be careful with that word. But, uh, to, <laughs> oh boy, thank you. That was my career. Uh, <laughs> we're both and, off of Twitter tonight. And, 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 and they're just not willing to do it. They see it as, yeah. war. As, as I said earlier, and Dennis Prager has, has pointed this out. You know, the, the leftist journalist is a leftist before he's a journalist. The leftist academic is a leftist before he's an academic. The leftist Jew is a leftist before he's a Jew. And right. the leftist comedian is a leftist before he's a comedian. So let, let, that leads me to a question for you, because uh, you, you, do, you do stand up. I just saw you recently. You, you killed it in a, in a comedy club uh, a few months back when I attended. Um, I like Nick DiPaolo. I, I like <clears throat> Bill Burr or some of these other guys that are out there because I don't get their politics. And if I do get their politics, it, it, I, I can put it to the side. Even a Mark Maron, when he's not talking about how much he hates Trump, I think is quite funny. Yeah. You have to separate it. Who's your favorite stand-ups today? Oh, my. It, it's so hard for me to say because I have so removed myself from that situation. It used to be back in the day. I would go to the improv literally from the moment it opened until the moment it closed. I went there to schmooze. I went there to, to meet people, but I certainly went there to go into the back room and watch one comic after another, after another, after another. I mean, I was so steeped in it for so long that these days I don't tend to watch stand-up com comedy. But of the old, first of all, there's a kid named Adam Yenser. And you'll remember him because he opened for yeah. me at, at that, that show you're referring to. He's a producer for Ellen DeGeneres? He's a writer for Ellen. Oh, and, writer. Okay. Right? And and that just goes to the show that you can be a conservative and, and, be, and write for the other side. Yeah. Um, he is just so clever, and I, I, and I like clever. But as far as the, the, the guy who says that he's, um, uh, he's not fat, he's fluffy, uh, he can make me laugh. I mean, Iglesias. Yes, yes. Yeah. Julio's son, I think. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, my, my youngest loves him. He's, yeah. he's, he's funny. No, I can, I can see it. I can see even Amy Schumer. You know, the problem is when their politics are so egregious and so infect their acts. Right. It's, it's hard to sit there and watch. You know, I've, I've got the problem with, with a number, all of us do, with a number of people we recognize to be talented but whose politics are, are, are just so vile and they won't leave them alone. That's the thing about, so often the insults are, are gratuitous. Right. They, just, they have nothing to do with storyline. They have nothing to do with plot. They have nothing to do with character. And it's just an opportunity to, to put that reminder, the, almost like Pavlov's dogs, the, ring the bell for the mindless idiots at home. <laughs> So um, you see somebody like um, a Jerry Seinfeld or a Chris Rock, they no longer will perform at colleges. Right. Isn't because, that mind-blowing? Because right. there could not be, and I, and I say this actually with respect, there could not be a more pablum comedian than Jerry Seinfeld. He talks about nothing of politics. He talks about, he talks about serials and Superman. <laughs> and he's too on PC. Yeah. To, to be allowed to speak freely on college campuses. And this is quite frightening. I mean, in, in so many ways, this is exactly what George Orwell warned us about. It's exactly newspeak is PC. PC is newspeak. Right. There's a line from 1984. I'm going to have to paraphrase. But he says to Winston, you do realize that newspeak is the only language in all of human history whose vocabulary gets smaller every year. What we are allowed to say gets less and less and less and less. And the point that he makes in, in 1984 is the ultimate objective is to make it so there's only one word for every con for each concept. That way, even if you wanted to rebel, you wouldn't know how to articulate it. What do you think about this trend happening right now where tweets from 10 years ago, yes, Twitter's been out that long, are now being uh, unburied and people's jobs are at stake? Right. I mean, it, it, it's 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 heart-wrenching it's terrifying it's not sonian right? we've, seen, we've seen it with comedians right we've seen it with comedians we're seeing we're seeing it across the board we're seeing it with politicians we're seeing it with statues we're, right. we're, seeing, yeah. it, we're seeing it with um uh, uh, songs like kate smith because 50 years ago she, but here's what's galling the most galling the most frightening yeah. is it's not each side that they're doing it to it's simply a weapon to be used against the right 
And it's not even what they actually said. It's how it can be used as a weapon against the right. They don't shut up the left. They don't shut up the, the fascists in the Democratic Party. They cheer them. They put them on committees. Right? They only shut up people on the right. How much of this is a tiny, insignificant group that just have a huge pedestal on Twitter as opposed to the general population that really doesn't care about this? What do you think? It, 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 it's twofold. It's not just you, you can't look at it just as Twitter any longer. All right. It's in the universities, it's in the schools. I know people who've lost their jobs as teachers, as math teachers, simply because they, they held the wrong political point of view. All right. I know people who have lost jobs in the entertainment industry that had nothing whatsoever to do with politics. It's, and it's, so it's twofold. It probably is, just like with every one of these vile ideologies. Fascism wasn't the dominant ideology of the people. It was a small group of revolutionaries. Right? Marxism in, in, with the Russian Revolution wasn't the people. It was a small group of powerful and, and vicious people. The Nazis weren't the majority. They were small. So, but here's how you can tell if the acts of the crazies, the ones that we're afraid of, is mainstream or not. And that is to watch and gauge the reaction of the mainstream to the crazies, all right? When we have a crazy on our side, David Duke, we reject him. We revile him. We ostracize him. We cut him out. He, he's, all right? When they have a, a, a crazy on their side, they embrace them. They put him up on a pedestal. How does Al Sharpton, how did Al Sharpton, this criminal thug, who has taken advantage of the black community and the white community, who has who incited the murder of Jews in New York City, how does MSNBC give him his own television show? All right, so it's not that Al Sharpton is a crazy, it's that the mainstream rewards their crazies while we reject them. That's how you can tell our crazies are not mainstream, their crazies are. And one of the most frequent visitors to the uh, last administration's White House, by the Absolutely. way. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, so we, we, I mean, I want to get much deeper into this with you. Uh, the, the the whole idea behind this uh, cr uh, this clampdown on free speech it's obviously coming from a philosophical side, the left, deep, deep left. Do you think moderate Democrats are concerned about this? Um, a sorry about that. A I don't know how many moderate Democrats are left because it's very hard for them to win a primary. Uh, it's very hard. Let's talk about voters, though. Uh, I, I, I think there's a number of things. One, the mainstream, the guy on the street Democrat, right, the true liberal, has been so cowed, so terrified about us. The left has done such, done such a great job of vilifying us. Right? I, I, I often do this little thing where I stun my audience with the following statement. I say... I, even as a New York City-born Jew working in Hollywood, I don't know a single person who votes Democrat. Not one. What I know is a lot of people who vote against the Republicans. Right. Right? So what the, the Democrats, right, what the Democrats have done is basically said, well, of course we've destroyed your cities. We've been controlling them for 50 years. Of course we've stolen your money. Look at the house I live in. Of course we've destroyed your families. Where's your husband? Where's your father? Of course we've destroyed the, the streets. Of course... But they're Nazis. They want to put you back in yeah. jeans. They want to. And this is not the radical left, as you would think. It was Joe Biden. All right. This, this supposed statesman, the vice president, a heartbeat away from perhaps their right now, their most likely standard bearer. Who, <laughs> I, I, I got to I got to think that you wish that you were still writing TV comedy with Joe Biden now back in the news with the grabby. Let's uh, continue this after the break. We've got Evan Sayat, uh, conservative He's a comedian, conservative comedian and political commentator. We'll be right back. Dave Sussman here at America's Voice News. And Dave Sussman back with you at Whiskey Politics on America's Voice News. And don't forget to hit subscribe on YouTube if you're not watching on the channel and follow all of our social media platforms. And we have Evan Sayet, conservative comedian and uh, a good friend and a great guy and an amazing author. If you haven't read Kindergarten of Eden, fantastic book, but his follow up, Apocalypse Now. Uh, let, I'll let you go ahead and explain it to our audience. Yeah, and I'm going to, sorry to interrupt, but two things I want to just correct uh, in the introduction. One is the first book, I always love 
it, it's not you. It's 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 it, it's not you, David. It's me. Um, <laughs> but I do like when people include the first subtitle because the the Kindergarten of Eden could be anything. It could be a John Grisham thriller. It, you know, it could be. Uh, but once you know it's the Kindergarten of Eden, how the modern liberal thinks, it, yes. it, it gives it gives the book a little more uh, context. Second, this is not a follow-up to it in any sense. My next book will be a follow-up to it. That book is going to be called, you might want to write this down for future reference, Countering Culture, The Left's War Against All That Is Human. I'll wait for the signed copy. Yes, sir. And <laughs> it might be a while. I'm still working on it. But this book is a faux children's book. Apocalypse right? Now. It, 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 Apocalypse Now. It's a departure from anything I've ever done before. And, and nor did I do it as a prestige piece or, you know, it, it was something I just felt was necessary because if you look back on all of the environmental catastrophes that we were threatened with throughout our lifetimes, each one after another after another, and by the same experts as now, the same word consensus. In fact, I, I, I released the book by no coincidence on Earth Day, which was April 22nd. Must that maybe two weeks ago now? On that day, CBS News ran a report from the first new from the first Earth Day. It was Walter Cronkite, and it was the same doom. Oh, we're doomed! And and we cut back to Walter Cronkite in the studio, and he can't even look up from the monitor. He's so it's like he'd gotten his own death sentence. All right, and after a beat, he he looks at the camera and he takes off his glasses and he goes, "The message is clear: act now or die." But that was half a century ago. Mm. <laughs> Not only has it the species been wiped out, we're more plentiful by far than we've ever been. We're more healthful than we've ever been. We have more energy than we've ever had. We have got more food than we've ever had. It was uh, 180 degrees from right. And, and yet, right after that, when that failed to come true, they had another prediction, and that failed to come true, and another prediction, and they were all act now or die. And even with global warming, it's act now or die, which is an old salesman's trick. Order now, limited supplies. Order now, time is running out. All right? They've invented these catastrophes, and then they've added every sales gimmick you can possibly add and not one of them has come true so i felt it was time to take them on on their own level the first book is called the kindergarten of eden how the modern liberal thinks because they are like children kindergarten and eden naive and and, and whatnot well this book treats them like their children well, it literally is, a, you call it a faux children's book. You can read it as a poem, like to a child in bed. And it's got some fantastic cartoons from, is it A.F. Branco? Yeah, it, it is indeed the, the great editorialist cart editorial cartoonist, A.F. Branco, yep. Yeah, so you're, you're reading it like a poem, and it's fantastic because it does go back. Listen, when I was in, a kid in the 70s, I remember, Ice Age, it's coming. And, it's coming. Right, and the killer bees and everything else. And oh, may, I, may, I, may I read a little to you? Please. I'm actually going to have to do this off the top of my head because I don't have it in front of me, so I hope I can do it. But here it goes. It goes, good night, my love. Yes, I know that you're frightened. So while you doze off, allow me to enlighten. I know about this thing of which they keep warning. I know about this thing they call global warming. But when I was your age, they said global cooling. An ice age, they said. Then they said, hey, just fooling. Next, a hole in the ozone they swore would cause pain. When that didn't happen, they yelled, acid rain. Well, when the rain came down, just as it always did, they conjured some new things with which to scare kids. First, the birds were diseased and the swine they had flew. If one didn't get you, the other would do. But when the pig and the bird turned out not to be bad, they turned to the cow who would drive us all mad. Well, that didn't happen. No one fell to their knees. But they went on undaunted and they yelled, killer bees. Right, it goes on from there, but the next one's actually my favorite, and I don't know if I can recreate it perfectly, but uh, when, when, when no one was stung, they just kept right on hissing. The real threat, they said, was that the bees had gone missing. Yeah. So basically, in one fell swoop, they went from there were going to be these swarms of bees, and that's how we were going to die, to there were no bees at all, and that's how we we're going to die. And of course, the 180 degrees from global cooling to global warming, it, it's... There's a great line in David Frum's book about the 70s where he says it really it was like it was like the Lord High Executioner in the Mikado. It really didn't matter what names he had on his list, just so long as he had names on his list. Or it doesn't matter what ecological disaster is going to kill us, just so long as one will. 
Obviously, the power structure is behind all of this. Uh, it's, it's, it comes down to a centralized government wanting to control behavior. Uh, you've got an Ocasio-Cortez, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, talking about 12 years until death. And Beto's going to one-up her and say, yeah, no, it's only 10 years. And uh, I mean, do you think by the time we get to uh, <laughs> the 2020 election, it's going to be a matter of months? No, uh, how I, hysterical I, I, is this? I've not actually gotten uh, a, a position paper from Kamala Harris, and we're already dead. That, that's her position. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure yeah, Willie like, Brown's got something reverse, to tell, say about that. It's, it's like a reverse, reverse auction to see who could care more about the environment. So we start off, we get, I got 12 years, I got 12 years, do I hear 10? Beto, okay, I need 10, do I hear 8? Do I hear 8? Yeah, right. exactly right. It's going to go right back to, we're already doing good. I don't think there's any argument that there is climate change because the climate always changes, right? right. Uh, but, but the statistics that are coming out and the projections that they're using right now, and they're talking about you know, CO2 levels being at, uh, what is it right now, about 400 parts per million. And they say, well, it used to be 350 and we're increasing. And that's why the sea levels are raising. And nobody wants to talk about the fact, uh, we've had a few scientists on the show talking about this very specifically, that, uh, you know, different parts of uh, our history, the globe had 3000 parts per million. So uh, where, what, what is this power structure? Where is it coming from? Who, who does it benefit? Right. Well, look, it, it benefits the one world socialists, uh, which is the ultimate goal of the open border people who don't even deny being socialists any longer. You know, and, and the scary part is that really makes them the heir to, to Hitler. All right. It's the same ideology as Hitler. You know, the way that the left has gotten away with pretending that Nazism came from the right was to ignore his socialism and say the evils were his nationalism. But A, Hitler wasn't a nationalist, okay? He was a globalist. The nationalist believes that the best, that the, the world is too complicated with its 8 billion people, its 7,200 languages, its 4,200 religions, its various climates and its various resources and its soils for a one-size-fits-all global uh, governance. Right? We believe that the best way to divvy up the world for, for the most efficient and the best outcome for all human beings is nation states, where the local people elect their local leaders who have local knowledge about all those different variables. Right? Hitler didn't want sovereign nations acting in their own best interests. He wanted the same thing Alexia Ocasio-Cortez wants, one world government. He was a socialist, and, and the national in national socialist doesn't stand for nationalism any more than the national and national football league means that, that, that Tom Brady is a Nazi. Yeah. Well, you know, he may have been friends with Trump at one time. Of course he's a Nazi, Evan. <laughs> he's Nazi adjacent. Nazi adjacent. That's a good zip code. <laughs> so, okay, uh, if we're taking a look at how this relates to our politics today, because again, you are a political comedian, you talk about uh, obviously our culture and what's going on right now. All of this is combined with this, uh, what we started talking about here, and that's the attack and control of our speech and how we can talk with each other. Um, how has this impacted, I, I want to say culture and entertainment. I know that's very, very broad, but what are you seeing right now as the trajectory or the trend that we're seeing being able to even create good content? People like yourself that used to yeah. write for Bill Maher, could you even exist in a Hollywood today? Well, first for, for two reasons. No one. I mean, I could conceivably get up and write jokes for Bill Maher. You know, uh, you're a gun for hire when you do that and you write in their voice and you write to their tastes. And if you don't write to their tastes, you get fired and rightly so. It's their show. Right. So there are two possibilities. I'm a pro. I could write for all these people just like I could write for lots of people that I didn't necessarily agree with. But I couldn't. Uh, you know, I never lost a job because of my conservatism. I stopped looking for jobs because of my conservatism. I stopped looking to, to get hired because I can't write for Bill Maher. I can't write for Jimmy Kimmel. How can I live with myself? So I, the minute I realized that I was a conservative and this was a culture war, I went a different way and I, and I created my own niche. I, as you know, I rent out the clubs. It's my show when I do comedy clubs. Uh, I, I write for myself now, whether it's long form, whether it's Apocalypse Now, my best-selling kids book that Dennis Prager calls uh, nothing less than a public service. Uh, 
trying to make up for lost time here. Buy my book, everybody. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, all the stories you're telling, it's only going to get worse. Uh, but what, what's, what's frightening is, look, Rahm Emanuel, and it's so amazing how many times the left actually says exactly what they believe. Right? Rahm Emanuel said, never let a good crisis go to waste. Right. All right, well, there's opportunity in crisis because people become scared. You know, people become, they're willing to fork over their money. Save me, save me, take everything I've got. And, and that's why these global warming hysterics do what they do. Sure. You know, if searching for an opportunity to get rich, then you have a vested interest in manufacturing. If you're looking for an opportunity for power, which is what this is about, you have a vested interest in faking doomsday scenarios. You know, one of the things that's interesting to me as a, as a observer of comedians and a fan of comedians, I mean, I listened to Richard Pryor and George Carlin on vinyl when I was a kid. Cheech and Chong was, I couldn't, I, I, I ruined records listening to that as many times as I could. Today, the outlet we find is usually mostly through uh, specials on Netflix or something like this. And we hear now that the Obamas are on the board of Netflix. And we're starting to see, you know, I, I turned on Netflix earlier this week and I saw Acasio's face in front of me. They've got a documentary about her already. Uh, does Do you feel that that is going to limit the ability for people that are not uh, essentially towing the party line to get opportunities? Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's one of the great problems is the gatekeepers. You know, and the gatekeepers overwhelmingly tend to be radical leftists for any number of reasons, including the fact that they're all filthy rich. You see, socialism is, is really, really good for the very, very, very rich. And it really sucks for everybody else because the very, very rich can buy their way out of the systems that they destroy. Mm. For, for example, I, I hate to use him as an example because I like him so much, but Bruce Springsteen uh, doesn't have to know or care about the public schools being destroyed because he buys his way out of it and sends his children to, to, to private schools. Right, right. All right, you don't have to worry about crime in the streets or, or San Francisco with human feces in the streets because they live in, in gated communities with private security guards. So the very, very rich can buy their way out of socialism. It's They can go see a doctor on their own. Look at all the socialist leaders who come to America to buy medical care. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So they can buy their way out of all the things they destroy for the rest of us. So are you concerned about the future of, I mean, I hate to keep coming back to comedy. We're going back and forth here, but this, I mean, here's, I think it's all about free speech, right? Here, here's the answer. I really try to stay hard to stay out of the future. I, I thought really, you were going somewhere else there. Sorry. I, 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 <laughs> I once asked David Horowitz, how do you do it? How, how do you get up every morning knowing what you know, seeing what you right. see, being accosted by what you're and, – and, and have a moment of happiness, have, have a moment of, of, of just comfort of, or not discomfort? And he said to me, Evan, I always remind myself the future has never been what I thought it was going to be. All right, so I stay out of the future. I'll give you just three very quick examples. I was nervous. In 2004, when, when it appeared John Kerry might beat George W. Bush, and, and then Dan Rather had those forged documents that he tried to steal the election with, who could have anticipated that, the just, Guard. At that moment, yeah. right, just at that moment, the blogosphere would have matured just enough that people in their pajamas could disprove it? John Hinderocker. Right? Let's, let's, let's flash forward to 2010. All right, Who could have anticipated that some obscure guy on some obscure cable business channel would utter the words Tea Party, mm -hmm. and suddenly this movement would, would come out of nowhere and so overwhelmingly affect the 2010 election? And finally, who could have predicted, and I was terrified, that, that, that Hillary Clinton was going to be the president, we were going to have four or eight more years of, of this radical, hate America, always socialism, and, it, and, it, and we'd be beyond the tipping point at that. And who could have anticipated that Donald J. Trump would beat 16 seasoned, qualified, many of them wonderful candidates, then beat Hillary Clinton, and then go on to become one of the greatest presidents in American history? Who could have anticipated that? So I really try to stay out of the future. I mean, the hope is found in a couple of things. We're going to need some Democrats and liberals to say, you know what? It's more important to me to be a liberal, lowercase l, than it is for me to be a Democrat. It's more important for me to be a patriot yeah. than it is for me to be an elected official. We're going to need – and look, you're seeing it sometimes. You're seeing it with Alan Dershowitz. All right? 
So it's going to take that. Other thing it's going to take very quickly is revolutions tend to eat their own. And you're going to see this, that as we are shut up, their next step isn't to stop there. It's to shut up the people just slightly to the left of us. And then when they're shut up, shut up the people slightly to the left of us until only their fascist ideology is allowed to be said. And as the Nancy Pelosi's and the Chuck Schumer's come under attack, as they have, Mm -hmm. as they have from from, uh, Alexandria uh, Ocasio-Cortez and others, as they have, they're going to have the choice of being Americans, or kowtowing to the most radical left. Yeah, we're seeing that with some of these uh, stars that have been uh, relegated to the dustbin just due to some of the... uh, I mean, could you believe Cher... Cher Cher stood up and agreed with Donald Trump about immigration a couple weeks ago. You know why? Because it's NIMBY, right? Not my backyard. Right. Right. Anyway. And and also because, look, there are sometimes... There are sometimes that... The left, the people on the left simply have never really looked right to see what's there or left. And, and you think about Tammy Bruce, who is a lesbian feminist, former president of now's largest chapter, right. who became an enemy of the state because she made the egregious error of actually siding with Nicole Simpson and not O.J. Simpson. Really, a feminist sided with an abused and murdered woman over the man who killed her? But that was politically incorrect. And so she became an enemy of the state. Evan, say it, folks. Check out Apocalypse Now. I assume Amazon, it's still climbing the charts. Is uh, the best place in evansayit.com. Is that right? As well, yep, absolutely. Okay, fantastic. And uh, greatly appreciate you taking the time, as always, my friend. And uh, this is a discussion we can have for hours, as we will, I'm sure, again, continue down the road. Uh, evansayit.com, follow him and check out his book. Get three, four, five. I know a lot of people are getting three, four, five copies for grandkids, for their kids, and everybody else as well. Well, one thing, do I have two seconds? Do I have two seconds? Two. All right. One thing they're doing is they're buying several copies. They're keeping one on the coffee table, or giving it to their grandchildren, and then they're 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 leaving copies around in public places like uh, uh, pediatricians' offices and for unwitting liberals to pick up and start reading because it looks innocuous. It looks like a kid's book. They have no idea really until they get to the final couple of pages how political it really is. You should have used the font from Highlights magazine. They would have picked it up. (laughs) Evan, thanks, my friend. Greatly appreciate it. We'll have you on again very, very soon. And uh, folks, thank you for uh, being with us. We will be back again very soon with another fascinating guest here. Dave Sussman signing off for Whiskey Politics and America's Voice News. Cheers. 